I am about to leave for Costa Rica, a place completely unfamiliar to me, and on a top secret mission for the CIA, no less. No guarantees I'll come back alive. Might even get rubbed out by the CIA itself. So I'm leaving behind this record for her sake, for the boss's honor. Ever since I was a child, I've loved to look up at the night sky. I'd go outside after sunset and drink in the cold air, the moon, Venus, so many stars floating on the edge of infinity. In Manchester, it wasn't very often you saw the night sky in all its star-studded glory, but it was enough to stir a deep longing inside me. Even as others cowered beneath Nazi air raids, I was out there watching the skies, dreaming of one day reaching the heavens. There were, of course, more practical concerns. My skin was incredibly sensitive. Even the slightest bit of sun would turn it an angry shade of red. Playing outside during the day was completely out of the question. Naturally, I hardly ever had the chance to play with other children my age. But I never felt lonely for it. Their way of thinking was irrational, making them simple, easy to predict. The boys would talk of tanks and aeroplanes and creepy, crawly bugs. The girls of pretty dresses, glass beads, and tea and cakes. Of boys they liked. I never had much to say on such matters. The curious thing is, adults really aren't all that different. They're simple, capricious. Especially men. As they get older, their heads fill with thoughts of women and more women. Thankfully, I always did have a head for mathematics. When I was about 10, I visited Dr. Turing, who lived nearby. We'd sit and discuss mathematical logic. The lights were always on at his house, even in the dead of night. Theoretically, he'd say, there's no algorithm that a computing machine couldn't reproduce. Dr. Turing wasn't foolish like other men, although I didn't find out why until later, after he died. The time will come, he'd say, when computers will be able to think for themselves. That idea rocked me to my core. My attitude for mathematics brought me closer to the stars. I breezed through school, then went to America for university. While I was studying at Caltech, NASA was established. I signed up in a heartbeat. I was a pretty good computer engineer at the time, and NASA needed skills like mine. The work was enjoyable. Even though I'd given up on going into space myself, it was a pleasure just being a part of it all. I was assigned to Project Mercury, America's effort to compete with the Soviets in manned spaceflight. Seven men were chosen as pilot candidates for the program, becoming heroes overnight. People called them the Mercury Seven. The project made good progress, more or less. We had all the funds and materials we needed. After countless hours of analysis, we even had plans for something on par with Sputnik. We thought it'd only be a matter of time before we caught up with the Russians. They'd sent a dog into orbit and brought it back safely to Earth. But NASA top brass dismissed that success as a fluke. The Americans recovered their re-entry capsules at sea, but the only ocean bordering the Soviet Union is the Arctic, so their re-entry capsules had to make impact on land. A dog was one thing, but human spaceflight would still take some time. Or so we thought. At the end of January 1961, we successfully put a chimpanzee named Ham into orbit. He returned to Earth as healthy as ever. NASA was giddy with success. It was then that a new woman showed up for duty. She was a backup pilot and advisor. She was beautiful, with blonde hair, strong mouth, and a steely gaze. But there was something else in those eyes, a twinkle of something warmer of affection. It was the boss. She took one look at us in our revelry and murmured, 
Savor this joy today, because tomorrow you'll have to face the truth. And she was right. The next day, our project schedule was accelerated. We'd received new information that the Soviets were mere months away from putting a man into space. The brass had misjudged the Russians. We couldn't afford to allow the shock of another Sputnik. Somehow, we had to get a man into space before the Russians did. It was an utterly impossible task. We'd only just put our first chimp up. With a human on board, failure was not an option. Especially if it were one of the Mercury 7 Golden Boys. And on top of that, the brass wanted to put a window in the spacecraft. The pilot wouldn't be a test animal this time, they said. And when this hero came back alive and well, they wanted him to describe what he'd seen. It was madness. Adding a window to our existing spacecraft would leave it unable to handle the stress. Not to mention the problem of shielding the occupant from cosmic rays. But the boss rose to the task, and splendidly. She claimed to be a layman when it came to space, but caught on keenly to new ideas and concepts. She was demanding of herself and of others. She seemed rather cold-hearted at times. But I was smitten. She was beautiful, yes, but more than that, she was wise. Her mind was thoroughly rational. And yet no matter how I tried, I could never predict her actions. It was easy for me to assume that her judgments were drawn from an enormous base of knowledge. Quite simply, her life experiences were more diverse, more intense than anyone else's. To me, they seemed boundless in their breadth. In her, I saw a reflection of the night sky. Perhaps because I too was a woman, she and I became close. I couldn't go out in the sun, but she lit up my life. Her light was soft, like that of the moon. I was so happy. With her unerring guidance, the project steadily regained its footing. But one issue remained, the pilot's safety. When the day came to choose a pilot, the Mercury 7 just quietly walked out. Who could blame them? It was far too great a risk to take. Even if they'd volunteered, NASA would never have let them go. They were national heroes, basking in the media spotlight. There was no way they'd be sent on such a mission. The conference room was silent. Then, slowly, she raised her hand, almost as if acting out a scene from a movie. I spoke out against her going, submitting a report stating the ray shielding was inadequate. But the brass's response was brusque. She's already been exposed to a nuclear test in Nevada. She's the perfect candidate. It was completely irrational. Repeated exposure to radiation would only increase the danger. But the government was still reeling from the Soviet success with Sputnik. There was no hope of getting a rational response. They were simply too panicked. People can be so obtuse when it comes to things they can't see. I, however, understood all too well. Just as invisible ultraviolet radiation scorched my skin, heavy particle radiation from space would cause irreparable harm to human tissue. In a word, she was expendable. It was during the boss's pre-flight checkup that I noticed something strange on the X-ray of her skull. Part of the right hemisphere of her brain was damaged. It seemed inexplicable, given her keen intelligence and amazing physical prowess, but there it was, and I decided to report it. I hoped that perhaps my discovery of a physical defect would result in the flight being cancelled. But as I went to make my report, she stopped me. Why, I demanded. How can you let yourself be their guinea pig? Ignoring my protests, she took me up to the roof of the lab. The night sky was ablaze with stars. It was there that I learned how she had wounded her head. 1943, Los Alamos. She was serving with the Special Forces when she received new orders. 
a German spy had infiltrated the Manhattan Project, which aimed to build the world's first atomic bomb. She was to eliminate him. His name was John von Neumann, a mathematician with superhuman computational abilities and the designer of the explosive lens. The Manhattan Project was a top national priority, security accordingly tight. The guards couldn't be allowed to know what was going on. She'd have to slip past them and make the death look like an accident. It should have been an easy enough mission. But just before the operation, she received unexpected news. A new life was growing inside her. She was overcome with joy. And for one brief moment, it clouded her judgment. She accidentally got into a shootout with the guards and without thinking, protected her belly. She was shot in the head. The bullet only grazed the surface of her brain, but the tissue around the wound was destroyed, leaving her in a coma. She wasn't given much chance of recovery, but three months later, she woke up. Within six, she was able to move around as if nothing had happened. It was functional compensation. The other parts of her brain took over for the part that was lost, it made logical sense, but such a full recovery was nothing short of a miracle. Perhaps her superhuman willpower made it possible. Or perhaps, perhaps my body knew it had to survive for the sake of my unborn child. She smiled as she said that. I understand how she must have felt. Some have taken to calling me Ms. Left Lobe, she said, because I'll do anything for the mission. She was tough, yes, but she had feelings too. I knew that better than anyone else. As it turned out, von Neumann wasn't the spy. The assassination order was a deliberate bit of misinformation planted by the Russians. She had been deceived. The Eastern and Western camps were united on one point, opposition to the Nazis. The Allies needed to develop that bomb before Hitler did. But in looking ahead, the Russians found the Manhattan Project's progress a little too quick for their liking. Mass production of a uranium bomb, like the one that was eventually dropped on Hiroshima, would be difficult from a material perspective. But a plutonium bomb, once perfected, could be mass produced and eventually even miniaturized. And Moscow did not like the idea of America having that kind of head start. Explosive lens technology was critical to the plutonium design, so the plan was to get rid of its pioneer, von Neumann. And when that plot came to light, the US and the Soviet Union parted ways for good. It was one of the rare cold nights in Florida. She put her arm gently around my shivering shoulders. As I listened to her voice, I was wrapped in her soothing scent I felt as if I were dreaming. Even in failure, she seemed perfect. Oddly enough, the failed assassination attempt helped preserve America's edge. A true super genius, von Neumann went on to make his mark in numerous fields outside of the Manhattan Project. Economic game theory, stored program computing. Almost all computers today use stored programs. The so-called von Neumann architecture his death would have set back computing 10 years, and I wouldn't be at NASA doing research. I wouldn't have been there in her arms that night. I thanked the fates for giving me that chance. But then she said something unexpected. I should have killed von Neumann when I had the chance. Why, I asked. Wasn't the order a Soviet plot? I looked up at her as she began to explain. Yes, von Neumann was innocent, and killing the innocent is a grave crime. But I can't help but wonder, had I succeeded, what would the world be like now? Even without von Neumann, the explosive lens would have eventually been developed. Von Neumann architecture, too. But she seemed to believe that if progress had been put off for a few years, then perhaps East and West would have had a chance to work hand in hand. I had never considered such a possibility, but her tone was confident, assertive. 
It was as if she intended to make the two superpowers shake hands herself. The explosive lens was developed too early, spawning a cold war and an endless nuclear arms race, she continued. That mission sprung from deceit, but maybe it was divine providence too. It was like she was speaking to her own child. Her large, warm hand was on my head. I failed the mission because I let the mother in me take over. I should have killed him, no matter how great the guilt. If I'd killed him, I might not have prevented Hiroshima, but maybe I could have saved everyone in Nagasaki. I looked up at her and saw her looking up too, up at the starry sky. Her face showed only deep remorse. It was as if she'd convinced herself that she alone was responsible for creating this twisted world. But that's no reason for you to sacrifice yourself for this. I knew I'd never dissuade her, and yet I still clung to hope. I know you're concerned and I thank you, but I have to be loyal to the end. And then she smiled at me. Loyal to the end. Loyal to what? I asked. But she didn't answer. The days that followed were spent training tirelessly for our first space flight. The boss endured conditioning that tested the limits of human capability, and I supported her. Those were happy days. On April 12th, the spacecraft carrying the boss left the Earth's atmosphere. Although it was only 20 minutes of ballistic flight, it was nothing short of miraculous, considering how little time we'd had. The first human in space. We were ecstatic. Then something went wrong. The re-entry angle was slightly off, warping the outer hull. The cause was clear. It was the hastily constructed window we'd installed. Her capsule missed the projected splashdown point by a long shot. As we raced towards the capsule, a breaking news broadcast came over the radio. It was the news report of the successful launch of the Vostok rocket, piloted by the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. They'd beaten us into space by the slimmest of margins. When we arrived, the capsule had already disappeared beneath the waves. The boss was floating on the surface. But I... I can't really recall what happened next. They told me later that I gave a strange scream and plunged into the sea, not caring whether my skin would burn. She didn't wake up. Her entire body was bruised, burnt, scorched by cosmic rays. It was a miracle she was still alive. Every day, propaganda boasting of the shining accomplishment flowed out of the Soviet Union. The hardest part was having to read the report the next morning from Izvestia, the Soviet governmental paper. Written there after the report were those legendary words of Major Gagarin, the Earth is blue. The person who should have said those words, though, was incapacitated, confined to a bed, NASA opted to pretend the flight had never happened. The Soviets had orbited a man around the Earth and returned him safely. We'd barely managed to escape the atmosphere and achieve ballistic flight. Even worse, the pilot was horribly mangled and the spacecraft lost altogether. As they saw it, covering it up was the only alternative to seeing the nation's pride dealt yet another blow. I've been told military records show the boss was taking part in the Bay of Pigs incident at the time. They were that desperate to erase the whole affair. In the end, Alan Shepard's ballistic flight one month later became known as America's first space flight. Shepard's flight owed its success to insights earned through the boss's sacrifice. But to me, none of that mattered. I prayed day and night for her recovery never leaving her side, not even for a moment. Then, as summer ended and the chill of winter approached, she spoke. Give me water. I threw myself on her breast, and she embraced me. It was all 
I need it. I thought she would tell me about space, the true sky where the stars don't twinkle. But the only thing she'd speak of was Earth, our home as she'd seen it from space, so fleeting, so irreplaceable. I was ashamed. I'd been enamored for so long with the sky that I never thought to look beneath my feet at the ground upon which I stood. As soon as her rehab was over, she was gone. It happened without warning. No one informed me, and the higher-ups wouldn't say a word. It wasn't so strange or surprising, really. I simply assumed she was off to complete her next mission, because she was loyal to the end. Since then, I've devoted myself to researching artificial intelligence, so that no one will ever have to make her sacrifice again. No human being should be asked to take on a mission that dangerous. Next time, I'll be the light that shines on someone else. I still wonder why she opened up to me on that chilly night in Florida. That operation was top secret, even if it was all in the past. I like to think it was because she trusted me. But that's probably not the case. She wanted someone to listen. And I don't think that someone was me. Those faraway eyes, the tone of her voice, like she was talking to her own child. Those things made it clear that she was speaking to someone else. I found myself envying that someone. Four years later, I learned of her death. A traitor's death, no less. She'd stolen an American nuke and defected to the Soviet Union, where she was killed by her former apprentice. Or so I was told. I refused to believe it. She'd never do such a thing. I could think of only two possibilities. Either she really was trying to bring East and West together, or she truly did want to be killed. She believed the world is not the way it's supposed to be, that it's been unbalanced by the tenuous peace offered of nuclear deterrence, and that she was to blame. Perhaps her death was an act of atonement. She was loyal to the end, to our world. <sighs> And I lost the light of my life. I now find myself victim to an incredibly <laughs> irrational emotion of my own. That someone, the one she wanted to confess her sin to, <sighs> could it be the one who took her life? The very thought drives me utterly mad with jealousy. <sighs> One day, I will discover the truth.